So good evening, everybody. Welcome to Sharzai and Bethel. And I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you and a warm welcome to Rabbi Adina Lewitis, who is continuing to join us and grace us with her presence. Um, a couple of programs actually coming up, starting with this series called Everyday Ethics, which I'm personally really, really excited for. And a five-part series called Ground Waves as well, which begins next week on Tuesday night with special guest Dan Sinor. So that's going to be really interesting. Um, but without any further ado, Rabbi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Adam. It is so nice to be back with everybody. It's been a long time. I'm delighted to uh, to be reconnecting. And uh, I see friends from Montreal. I'm friends from New York. And it's just, it's great to to, uh, to all be together. You know me well enough by now to know that whenever I have the opportunity to teach Torah, I always open with an igun, with just a short wordless melody to center ourselves, to open our minds, expand our hearts, and ready ourselves to do business uh, with Torah. So join me, if you will. I na na na, I na na na. I nai na I na na I na I na I na na I 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 na Um, Adam, is my, uh, is my internet wobbling or are we doing okay? A little bit wobbly, but let's see, let's see how it goes. Okay. If it gets too wobbly. Like right now it's perfect. Okay. If it gets too wobbly and you can't hear me, I'll let please you just know. give me a signal and I'll, uh, I'll move yes. rooms, uh, in my apartment. I don't know. Maybe that was like the Kaddish Baruch who's saying, stop singing. <laughs> who knows? <laughs> Maybe the Kaddish Baruch Hu is not a chassid and is a litvak and says, enough with the nigun. <laughs> Maybe you know the Kaddish that Baruch Hu is not a chassid. Do, do you all know the story about uh, Rabbi Mordechai Kaplan, who is the father of what is now called Reconstructing Judaism, not Reconstructionist Judaism, Reconstructing Judaism. And his whole theology is, is about God not being a divine being, but about being the power within us to, to do good and to bring goodness into the world. So he's being interviewed. I'm going back, you know, it's got to be 50, 60 years. He's being interviewed by a, a Jewish radio program in, uh, in New York. And the interviewer asks him to explain his theology, particularly his lack of belief in a divine being. And Rabbi Kaplan takes a breath and is ready to explain. And all of a sudden, the transmission gets all staticky and all, you know, broken and the program comes to an end. And everyone always laughed about that. That was God saying, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> anyway, okay. I am thrilled to welcome you all to uh, the first of three sessions, Everyday Ethics. This class is inspired by a column in the New York Times Magazine, which has been around for many decades now, um, called The Ethicist. Every weekend in the Saturday Times Magazine, there is a there is a column that takes questions, ethical questions, um, not ones about solving uh, for immigration reform or the climate crisis necessarily or for political reform, but questions that touch the day to day lives that all of us go through during which we make what might seem to us to be very mundane decisions. Where should I get my coffee? Uh, where should I shop for my new hiking boots? Um, my friend confided in me, but the truth is I really don't want to sit with this information by myself. Uh, those kinds of micro decisions that we make, which we may think of as, as not terribly significant, but actually reflect our deeply held values and contribute to the world of um, ethics and justice and goodness and integrity that we all have the responsibility to build one decision at a time. 
So this class takes a submission from one of the New York Times ethicist columns. We'll talk about it. I'll invite some preliminary responses from you to the question at hand. We'll distill from within the question the main Jewish values that are at stake. And then we're going to blow up the conversation with some Jewish sources and try to understand what it would be like to wrestle with this question as the ethicist with the benefit of Jewish wisdom. And then we're going to circle back to our question and see if our responses in, that we shared at the beginning have evolved in any way based on now having the wisdom of Jewish tradition. Um, and then the very last thing that I'll do is I will share with you the words of the ethicist um, in terms of how he responded to the question that was submitted. Um, the ethicist uh, started with uh, Randy um, Cohen many, many decades ago. There have been several other thinkers and writers who have played the role of the ethicist on behalf of the New York Times. Right now, the ethicist um, is a professor of law and ethics at NYU by the name of Kwame Anthony Appia. Um, but I want to invite you to take a look at the source sheet that you have. Um, there is also a link to it. If you haven't downloaded it yet, there's a link to it in the chat. So you can open it up in another screen if you wish. This is a submission that came from, I believe, March of 2014 to The Ethicist. Let's set up the question. I'm just gonna read it. This is how it appeared in the magazine. I was discussing with a friend whether it is permissible to boycott Woody Allen's films in the wake of the sexual abuse allegations. We both thought it would be wrong to further empower someone who may have sexually abused a child, but our legal system is built on the principle that the accused are innocent until proved guilty. And preserving that value is important whether or not you believe the allegations. Is it permissible in this case to boycott or should we presume innocence? This my friends of course is a very, very serious issue. And it's, uh, it's sad, though this question came uh, in March of 2014, we know that we have been dealing with various iterations of this question pretty much, uh, uh, it feels like, uh, every week since. We have seen uh, political leaders, entertainers, artists, sports heroes, um, and religious leaders across the denominations. Um, become the subject of allegations around uh, sexual harassment, sexual abuse. Sadly, we've seen many of them in the Jewish community. It's uh, only a couple of months ago now that there was a report released by Hebrew Union College, which is the flagship institution of the reform movement, um, chronicling decades of sexual misconduct at the highest levels of leadership and we have seen organizations in other Jewish denominations, uh, including the conservative movement, uh, have to struggle with similar allegations um, that have strained our Jewish community's sense of our own integrity and are calling us into deeper and deeper levels of accountability and responsibility. So this session, prompted by this submission to the ethicist, takes on the question of the choices we make around what music we listen to, what Torah commentary we read, what melodies we sing in synagogue, how do the choices we make that seem so innocuous and frankly so private relate to our obligations to both ensure the safety of our communities and people who are vulnerable within them and also align with our values around what we deem to be appropriate or inappropriate behavior. So um, now that we have the question on the table from the ethicist, I'm gonna take just a minute or two and see if any of you have literally in, I, 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 I'm gonna ask you to pause on the larger, longer explanations. Just give me your first instinct and keep in mind how this question is phrased. Is it permissible to boycott which is a different question then, is it permissible to continue watching? We're gonna try and get at this from both angles, but give me your preliminary, your preliminary uh, uh, thoughts. Feel yourself and, uh, and share your thoughts. Morton. 
And then Bennett, I see your hands. Yeah, if you can raise your hands even better. Okay, I think the issue of boycotting is really irrelevant. I can decide to uh, go to a Woody Allen film or not go to a Woody Allen film for any of a, a dozen reasons. Uh, so the, the real ethical issue is whether you're going to presume that he is guilty. Are you going to boycott because you think he's guilty? Or you can just say, well, yeah, I may boycott because I'm just don't like the idea that he's involved in this, but I, I, I'm reserving judgment about whether he's guilty. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bennett? Hi, everyone. So this is very interesting because with the uh, domination or spread of social media, so many people are found guilty without any due process. And I, and I think you have this, this very similar uh, situation here. I mean, everybody just kind of votes online. You're guilty and you're, you know, we had people in the U.S. Senate and whatnot who wanted Cuomo to step down before, you know, Letitia James had her, did her job, let her do her job. He was guilty. Get, get out of there. But I know too many people, both in the business world and privately, who were accused of major crimes. If I, they, they were totally innocent. I mean, nothing ever came of it. They were just falsely accused. So I think we have, you have to be very careful. And I think this goes at the heart of our country. You're innocent, to, you know, you're proven guilty. Thank you, Bennett. Um, I see Susan, you've uh, raised your hand. If anybody, if you don't know this yet, if you go down to the um, uh, to the reactions tab on the bottom of your screen, you'll have an opportunity to raise your hand. Uh, Susan. Sorry, I had to get that dog bowl away from the puppy. So my question, and it's and and this is part of the reason why uh, I joined, is because when I think about these boycotts, uh, there are so many amazing movies, uh, and and a movie isn't just one person; it's a team. Somebody wrote the script, somebody acted all the parts, somebody did the, did the music. I I, I just I think there's a, a bigger issue. I might dislike what somebody did. Sorry, that's the dog in the background. But anyway, I think you get my, my drift. The other question I hope will answer, hopefully he'll be quiet. I remember studying art history and fell in love with the guy and his ballerinas. And then I found out he was an anti-Semite and I found it very hard to reconcile my love of his paintings and the fact that he hates Jews. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see William and then Shirley and Avram, and then I'm gonna move us uh, further along our study tonight. Um, William, you're, you're uh, still muted. There we go. Okay. Um, well, you know, I see the question, I understand it. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the, the ethical issue is really one of proximity. Uh, let me explain what I mean by that. I don't believe that the issue of guilt is particularly relevant except in relation to proximity. So, Woody Allen, of course, is the example that frequently comes to mind these days. Uh, you could look at Degas, you could look at Wagner, uh, you could look at all the, some of the German um, musicians and composers who stayed in Germany during the Second World War and continued their careers and flourished uh, under the Nazis and so forth. Assuming that Woody Allen is guilty of sexual molestation and recognizing, for example, that Degas was an anti-Semite in his uh, pronouncements, and Wagner certainly was, uh, does that mean that knowing their guilt, I should not appreciate or enjoy their work? For myself, no. I believe it's a personal choice, obviously. 
I think one is free when it's per, it is permitted to do what one feels is right in that regard. But it, there's a difference between Woody Allen, the filmmaker whose movies I enjoy, and Woody Allen, whom I might want to have as a friend or an employee. Uh, and you can extend that all along um, uh, to any creator whose um, views uh, you would disagree with, whom you would find uh, to, uh, okay. to be uh, beyond the pale. But okay. if that person, it's that, there's a difference between that person being your friend and associate and that person who at a distance is a creator of works that you enjoy and appreciate. Thank you, William. That's uh, you know adds another another layer for us to examine. Um, uh, I I would just r remind us that there is great power in the way we make our choices around public um, media because oftentimes and and I'm certainly not prepared to say that that's the case here. And I think Morton was perhaps going in this direction. Um, one of the variables we have to ask ourselves is whether our choice to consume or not consume actually has the impact that um, we're talking about having. The way we want to um, both promote people whose values we believe are aligned with our project of building just and loving societies and, want, and the way we wish to uh, diminish the presence and lower the volume of the voices whose of people whose values actually cause great harm and disruption to the societies that we feel obligated to build. So that's another variable that we're gonna to have to look at. I'm gonna ask Shirley and often for your quick comment and then we're gonna move forward. Okay, I think with the social media, it takes can take a life of its own and whether a person is innocent, uh, they may not easily recover. Um, I, I think of the case of Steve Pakin from the agenda on TVO in Ontario, he was accused of sexual harassment and it looked like his career would have been totally destroyed. Uh, what went well for him is that his employer stood by him and kept him on air and an external investigation proved that the uh, accusations didn't have any basis. So he's still on, on air, but it worked out. But it could easily, even if he was innocent, would have destroyed his career. Yep, I think that was uh, where Bennett was going with his comment, uh, knowing too many people who, once the allegations are made, it almost becomes irrelevant to, right. to way too many people as to whether there was um, you know, a, a clear crime committed or not. And in fact, um, there was a comment made earlier about the assumptions around Woody Allen's misconduct. Woody Allen has never been found to be in a court of law guilty of what we all uh, cringe about when we think of him and what prompted this very question. I'm going to take um, the mic back now, so to speak, and I'd like to do the following. I'd like to share with you some background on this whole concept of sanctions, this whole concept of, um, of marginalizing those in our society who we believe merit marginalizing. Where does this come from? How does this get played out um, in the Jewish community? I'm gonna take us through some steps. First of all, I wanna remind us that the use of sanctions um, is the oldest, uh, one of the oldest tools for social control, as old as societies them. The types and the forms of sanctions have always evolved based on uh, the particular organization in mind, but the threat of being sanctioned has been used, um, the threat of being ostracized from the community has been used for millennia to guide people to accept the laws of the collective and to comply with those expectations. Um, the one who has the power to ostracize is the one who has in their hands the ability to control the social uh, behavior of people who belong to the community. Because if being ostracized would result in the experience of almost a living death, 
people were very, very careful not to make themselves vulnerable to that kind of, uh, that kind of punishment. What are some of the big Jewish ideas that are part of this conversation? I'm gonna take you through three and you're uh, invited to follow along in your source sheets. The first big idea comes from the book of Vayikra. Don't render unfair decisions. Don't favor the poor or in any way show deference to the rich. Judge your kinsfolk fairly. Use measured, balanced, rational, reasonable, fair approaches when deciding someone's guilt or innocence. That gets encapsulated in the statement that the rabbi's script in Talmud in the Babylonian Talmud, Masachat Shavuot, Dan et Chavercha Lechaf Zechut. Judge another human being favorably. That's the way that we tend to. Uh, to translate that, right? Dan lechaf zechut. Oftentimes that gets interpreted as give someone the benefit of the doubt. A modern day Musarist, a modern day um, colleague and, and someone who is very um, involved in translating um, ancient Jewish ethics for a modern contemporary ethical uh, mindset, Rabbi Alan Morini's, he talks about how actually done the chavzuchut means a whole lot more than just give someone the benefit of the doubt. What he understands done the chavzuchut to mean is that we have a responsibility if we see behavior that is to us seemingly improper, inappropriate, that we should not just consider somebody innocent until they're proven guilty, but we should try to look for mitigating factors that may have been present in that person's choices. To really take a broad view as to what might have propelled that person to act in that way and to even potentially uncover redeeming or positive virtues within that very scene or certainly within that very person, convinced as he is and as our tradition is, that there is no human being who is bereft of some good qualities. So dan lechav sechut, according to Rabbi Marinis, means a whole lot more than just wait for someone uh, to be proven guilty. It means to really exercise some effort in trying to understand what my shemens of that a good name is better than is better than fragrant oil. Adam, I, am I okay? My, I just got a note that my internet was unstable. Am I doing out. okay? Send it out. Okay, I'm I'm gonna move. So bear with me. A better name is is sorry. A good name is better than fragrant oil. Underscores our traditions sense of how critical it is to be someone in society who is experienced as a person of goodness, a person who can be trusted, a person who has integrity. The other big Jewish idea that I bring to this conversation is the notion of Kiddush Hashem and Chilul Hashem, the capacity that we each have in our hands, in our choices, in our mouths with the words that we say to be bringing a sense of honor to God and to our people and our tradition, or chalila, to be a source of desecration and denigration, right? Our choices are choices that don't exist only under the cover of night where nobody else can see us. We are public social beings. And when we behave in ways where other people can view our actions, in particular, when they know that we are Jewish, we have within our, uh, uh, within our choices, the power to bring honor or to bring shame on our people. The other and final piece that I wanted to, um, to bring here is this notion of teshuvah. And this is something we're gonna be talking about in, uh, in more detail. The whole concept of repentance, and the role that teshuva plays in our deliberations over the worthiness of somebody continuing to be a part of our communities and promoting them their work or not. We see in Masachet Nidarim this, this teaching that there were seven things, in another area it says 10 things, 
I brought you this one. It, seven things were created even before the world was created. The Torah, Teshuvah, Gan Eden, Gehenna, God's throne of glory, the temple, the Beit HaMikdash, and the name of the Mashiach. We could spend lots of time talking about why Dafka those things, but I want to focus on why Dafka Teshuvah, why Dafka repentance. The tradition is telling us that even before the world was created, even before human beings came into being, there had to be a mechanism in place to restore to goodness a human being who would fail, who would make a mistake, who would cause pain, or God forbid, shame. The understanding of our tradition is that there is no human being who will not stand on that precipice over the course of their lives. And so no human life is sustainable without the capacity to come back from making poor decisions. So teshuvah had to be created even before human beings were created. We couldn't last a moment. Okay. Any questions on the big Jewish ideas? that I uh, teased out here in deliberating this question. The internet's still a little bit wobbly. Really? Yeah. Oh my God. Um, okay, that's not happened to me. Okay, we're trying to uh, finesse here. Am I okay for the moment? For the moment, all good. Okay, sorry. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Rabbi, if you if we do not know somebody is guilty of anything because he hasn't been proven and we make the allegation that he is, are we not bear, bearing false witness or potentially? Stanley, that's a very, very important point. And that goes into the whole category of Ashon Hara, Rechilut, to be Motsi Shemra. There are so many categories of how we could misspeak about someone. And you make an excellent point about how critical it is that we refrain from creating the problem if we are not um, either firsthand knowledgeable about a situation, which in and of itself doesn't give us license to talk about it. And certainly, um, um, you know, absent publicly available information that comes after a proper vetting of the of the uh, circumstances, we shouldn't be speaking at all absent that information. Um, so that's another big Jewish idea. Thank you, Stanley, that we should put up on this. Let's dive a little bit into the Jewish sources that can bring some texture and some depth to our discussion. Now, the word that we use in our tradition for marginalized someone, for boycotting someone, is the word cherem, right? Cherem. Now, in its earliest manifestations in the tradition, in the Torah, cherem meant to remove something or someone from the community, either because it was dedicated to God for sacred purposes, or because it was deemed unforgivably offensive to God. So in the Torah, uh, for example, in the source from Shemot, the first source that you have, Zevach Lelohim Yecharam, Bilti Ladonai Levada, whoever sacrifices to a God other than our God, that person should be Yecharam, right? Should be set aside, cast out, um, marginalized. Here, sometimes it's even defined as destroyed. Here, this person no longer has a place in the community. Uh, if you take a look at Bamidbar, another example of that same meaning. If you give this people that we're about to go to war against into my hands, we will. Same word, we will proscribe their towns. We will destroy their towns. We will, um, uh, we will make them cease to exist, if you will. Just for your 
out of interest in Vayikra, the third source, we see this other meaning of cherem <clears throat> about something that is dedicated to the temple, dedicated to God, and as such, cannot be used by any other human being. Um, it, it, this is the other meaning that shared sense of something being set aside, something being untouchable, something being unrelatable. So in the Torah, Cherem is concerned with either the acts of an individual devoting things to God, after which that thing could not be utilized in any way, or it means something that is completely destroyed, that is completely silenced or marginalized. What happens post-biblical times is that in the, uh, after the Babylonian exile, the term cherem began to take on the meaning of marginalizing people who disobeyed the law or rabbinic authorities. If the rulers, if the rabbinic rulers or the religious authorities in a community experience somebody as being disobedient and disruptive to the community, the person was punished by being put into isolation from the community. That isolation could have lasted anywhere from one day to an entire lifetime, depending on the urgency of, um, of the, or the offense, the extent of the offense of their behavior. Once the cherem came to an end, the individual was re integrated into the community, provided they repented for their action. These kinds of shunning, this kind of marginalization exists in other traditions as well. Um, it exists in the Catholic church. The Arabic word haram is related to the word cherem and also means something that is forbidden, something that is taboo, off limits or immoral. When these laws of cherem get explicated in the tradition, we see how later um, halachic authorities bring uh, these, these parameters for cherem together. So take the, um, the Talmud lists 24 different offenses that are punishable by excommunication. And I've brought them to you as they are redacted through Maimonides Mishnah Torah um, in source four. Now I'm not gonna read all of them with you. You can quickly peruse them. Take a look at the range of things for which can be put in Pharaoh. I'll invite you to pay attention for a moment to number 23 down at the bottom of the list, being made the subject of a scandal, right? In the case of a religious authority. Now, you'll notice that many of these offenses are ones that uh, are interpersonal in nature where one person either risks or offends the sensibility of another. Like if you keep a savage dog that could hurt somebody um, or that is akin to placing a stumbling block before the blind, you're out. Um, some of these offenses are more in what we would consider the ritual or, or religious realm. If you take God's name in vain, or you're, if, you're, if you put yourself out there as a kosher butcher, but you actually sell non-kosher meat uh, deceptively. Um, there's a vague one listed there as taking Jewish law lightly. There's a wide spectrum. But what, what, what brings all of these offenses together, the, the um, line through them all, is somebody acting in a way that is considered to be heretical given the values of the community. Now, the Talmud takes this very seriously, forbids the community from coming within six feet of somebody who was put into cherem. During medieval times, cherem could even be extended to the family of the person who was uh, excommunicated. Um, there were quite uh, elaborate rituals that were involved in declaring somebody being put into cherem. The shofar was blown in front of the open Aron Kodesh. The community would come with an energy of mourning, holding black candles as if they were grieving. The leader of the congregation would shout curses from the Torah at the person who was being sentenced to cherem. And a public warning was issued forbidding anybody to associate with that person while they were marginalized. And then for dramatic 
effect. We read how the candles were one, two, three, boom, extinguished to create this, this drama. Again, the purpose of all of this is to create um, a, to, to disincentivize anybody from taking risks and behaving in ways uh, where they themselves could be vulnerable because nobody would want to be the object of those kinds of very serious communal dramas. Um, as I said before, cherem could extend for an indefinite period. During that time, you weren't permitted to teach Torah to the, inf to the, the one who was in cherem. You, you would not be permitted to benefit them in any way you will only be able to make sure that they have the necessities, food, drink, shelter. Um, this was a legal pronouncement of the rabbinic court in the town. Uh, the legal procedure leading to this announcement was often not as rigorous uh, in, as in uh, other judicial cases. For example, circumstantial evidence was admitted, to your point, Stanley. Um, there was a certain arbitrariness that historians have identified in terms of the procedure that was put into place. And interestingly enough, there were also um, more, more moderate forms of cherem, more moderate forms of excommunication. There was something called the nidui. The nidui was a form of excommunication um, that was imposed for a period of seven days. In ancient Palestine, it was imposed for 30 days. It was generally, um, um, imposed after a public warning was given to the person in question, a hatra'a. When was that warning given? That warning was given on Mondays, Thursdays, and then again the following Monday. Why was it, why was the warning made on Mondays and Thursdays? Right? Those were market days, and those were days that brought people into town, and consequently, those were Torah reading days when people could daven together in community. So people could hear it and the person would be apprised of it and others would know what was happening as well. During the period of the Nidui, um, only members of this person's immediate family was permitted to associate with them or come within six uh, um, feet of them or to eat with them. This person was expected to exhibit the, um, uh, the behaviors of mourning not to bathe, not to cut their hair, not to wear leather shoes, to observe all the laws that pertained to one who was grieving, couldn't be counted in the minion. They could go to school, but they could not be counted in the minion. If such a person died during this period of time, a stone was placed on their hearse. Relatives were not obliged to participate in some of the rituals around mourning, like Kriya, the tearing of the garments. And it was in the power of the court to either diminish or increase the severity of this nidoi. They might increase the number of days, they might reduce the number of days. They may forbid all interaction with this person. They may even exclude their children from going to school or their wife from being admitted into the synagogue until this person appropriately acknowledged their misbehavior, did tshuva and obeyed the court's mandates. Now, <laughs> these are pretty serious consequences. And one would imagine that there were many, if put into such a situation, may just say, you know what, to heck with you guys and leave the community. But even the knowledge that this could push somebody that far did not prevent the court from uh, this kind of rigorous punishment. Um, so the point was you start with a knee doing, you could extend it by another 30 days, and then another, and if the person remained recalcitrant, then a complete harem ban was imposed. And if that person um, died before doing tshuva or before the harem was lifted, um, they were considered to be completely, completely uh, obliterated from the community. They were not buried in a Jewish cemetery. Their children were, um, were not to recite Kaddish and there was no matseva, there was no tombstone put on their grave. Okay, that's uh, that's pretty serious stuff. Um, let's think of some of some of um, some of the more famous cases that we may be familiar with. Uh, during his lifetime, Moses Maimonides, Rambam, often came under attack from members in the rabbinic community because of his reluctance to acknowledge that everything in the Torah was as it's written. Um, very famous, his initial. 
um, refusal to include Triatamitim, the resurrection of the dead, in his writings uh, after his death. Uh, this is referred to as the great Maimonidean controversy. After his death, there were rabbis from Northern France who placed a cheyrim on Maimonides' writings, banning all of his works from their communities. And just as a show of good measure, the rabbis in Southern France and in Spain issued a cheyrim in return onto the opponents of Maimonides. In the 17th century, most famous case of cheyrim, uh, Baruch Spinoza, 1656 in Amsterdam, placed into cheyrim for denying the divinity of the Torah, for denying the existence of God, for denying the immortality of the soul. Um, people thought that he had converted to Christianity. He actually hadn't. We might refer to Baruch Spinoza as the first secular or perhaps atheist Jew. Um, in 1918, in Odessa, there was a cheyrim placed on early Russian communists like uh, Leon Trotsky and, uh, and some of his fellows. Except in very rare cases, in the Haredi Hasidic communities, after the Enlightenment, uh, cheyrim stopped being used as a tool for social control because, after all, Jewish communities lost their political autonomy. Jews were being integrated into the larger social and political networks um, uh, in the in the societies uh, in which we lived, and so the effectiveness of the cheyrim was undermined, and it essentially stopped being used. Though in 1945, Mordechai Kaplan, the same rabbi I told the story about right at the beginning, the founder of Reconstructing Judaism, he was excommunicated by the Assembly of the Union of Orthodox Rabbi, the Haredi rabbinic um, uh, organization in the United States, because his ideas uh, about Judaism uh, were very critical of the Orthodox movement, even very critical of the reform movement, um, and was considered offensive uh, to many people. Uh, in 2004, the High Court of South Africa upheld a cheyrim against the Johannesburg businessman because he refused to pay his former wife alimony as ordered by the religious court, by the Beit Din. Uh, in 2006, the chief rabbinate in Israel issued a cheyrim against the Nature Karta, the um, um, very right-wing, ultra-Orthodox community, anti-Zionist community who attended the international conference to review the global vision of the Holocaust, a very uh, dangerous uh, um, uh, organization. Um, and there were many Nature Karta leaders who, um, uh, who attended that. Uh, many other Haredi religious leaders, including the leaders of Satmar and, and the Chabad community um, issued this cheyrim. We know, by the way, that there are many men in Israel, many recalcitrant husbands in Israel who refuse to grant their wives a get, who are sitting in jail, um, rather than actually issue their wife a writ of divorce. Uh, I think one of the most, most, um, yeah, I'll say it, it's a chilul Hashem that rabbinic authorities across the Jewish landscape have not figured out how to deal with the question of the aguna and to um, rehabilitate the dignity of women who are married to abusive husbands by formulating a way for them to exit the marriage, preserving their physical and mental and spiritual well-being and the opportunity to rebuild their lives. Um, we, of course, in the conservative movement and in other uh, movements beyond the Orthodox community have for many decades now, um, but it is a chilul Hashem, seriously, that there are men sitting in Israel uh, refusing to grant their wives a get and instead preferring to be in jail. Let's bring it home to our modern world. The question around who today might be subject to a cherem, who might be worthy of consideration in um, contemplating whether they should be marginalized or silenced in the Jewish world. We, we have the example of what it is. Allen in front of us. Someone already raised uh, Wagner and other uh, artists. We have politicians who lie and who cheat. We have professional athletes who beat their wives and who are on network television every single Sunday. Um, we have musicians like uh, Dua Lipa, who's a very famous pop musician 
with heinous anti-Zionist politics? Should we go to her concerts? This is a different question, I think, than, you know, should I associate with people whose politics I don't like? It's a related question, but it's different once we feel that a line has been crossed. Either, either making people vulnerable or actually having caused harm and injury. Leslie Wexner, who was known to have uh, connections to Jeffrey Epstein. And, and this is a hard one for, for many of us. Even uh, Rip Shlomo Karlibach, who um, was uh, accused of some instances of self-propriety, um, mostly after he died. Rabbi Karlibach's music, one of the most uh, one of the most powerful transformations in the world of davening of Jewish, is credited to the, the artistry of Rabbi Shlomo Karlibach. We sing Karlibach Nigunim, we don't even know that we're singing Karlibach Nigunim, that's how pervasive his music is. Should we be singing his melodies? When there are women today in our communities who were victims as they experienced themselves to have been of Rabbi Karlibach. You know, as a society, we have often separated the act from the actors in many realms, in many realms. Ought we do so? Under what circumstances? Do the variables that you all, those of you who spoke before, shared, including proximity, including uh, whether there's been judicial process, um, do those matter in our calculations? I want to, I'm going to uh, say a couple of more things and then I'll pause for some of your comments. What are the variables that we really need to be considering? when someone presents them in this way. We talked about Dan Lechav Sechut, about judging innocent until proven guilty, about needing to look far and wide for mitigating circumstances. If somebody has not been prosecuted, does that make a difference? If someone has been judged and deemed innocent, but doubt still lingers for you, like many may feel about Woody Allen, how does that variable calculate into your thinking, right? Given the dangers, as many of you raised already, of that scarlet letter, where simply the allegation could, be, could mean lifelong condemnation for someone. It was also raised, I think Susan raised this, that boycotts don't only affect the one person that you're aiming for, right? Think of if you're targeting uh, Woody Allen's movies, to no longer watch them. Think of all the other actors and all the other employees whose livelihoods depend on the revenue generated by those projects, right? Think about how we felt when I just shared with you before that the wives and the children of somebody being put into Kherim could also be put into Kherim themselves. Does it make a difference if we're talking about somebody's past work or somebody's future projects? Does it make a difference if we're talking about an artist who is long dead versus someone who is still alive? Does it make a difference if we're talking about content that is religious in nature versus content that is secular in nature? Does it make a difference as to what our motives are? Whether our motives are to stand in solidarity with those who have been wronged versus our motives to silence or marginalize those who have been accused? Are there gradations of morality to which we are responding? Is working with James Franco or Aziz Ansari the same thing as working with Harvey Weinstein? What about the impact that our boycott may or may not have if there's a tightly knit community and if that community values staying tightly connected, then perhaps putting somebody into Kherum is actually still a very powerful tool of social control. But if the community and the social life of the community actually does not have that kind of impact and certainly is not 
part of the economic lifeline of the person in question, such that deciding to boycott them is really not going to make much of a difference to them. Do we have a different set of responsibilities or are we relieved of our responsibilities in a different way? Is your goal to erase the presence of someone or just to diminish their contributions or diminish their status? Are we using the chirim as a modeling of punishment to deter others from making the same bad choices? And where does the line get drawn between ensuring community safety and expressing our moral indignation? What else are among the, va the variables that we need to put into these calculations? What else do we need to be thinking about? See if anybody has anything that you wanna put on the table before we then dive even deeper into how we're gonna negotiate some of these. Okay. Very tough calls, <laughs> very I'm tough assuming calls. You're yeah. Yeah. Well, I, Rabbi, I think we have to be particularly careful depending on the alleged offense. For example, in the case of sexual assault or the allegation of sexual ass assault, it is one of the most difficult charges to defend yourself against because there's no wit there's very often no witnesses. Is there then a greater obligation of care before you accuse somebody? I bring the example of the Duke University lacrosse team. Uh, if you remember, they were accused of assault assaulting this young lady, and but for the financial wherewithal of one of their fathers, who happened, I think, to be a lawyer, to contest the charges, they were proven to be uh, innocent, and the young lady recanted and said she lied. Now, people were ready to hang. They were, dis they were, dis they were expelled from school. Their reputations were in the mud to be, and that was high, and people were ready to do anything to these young men who did this awful thing to this young girl. I'm not, I'm just saying, is there not a greater obligation to, you know, these, this, this maximum of innocence developed over centuries. And this protection, although in some cases we don't want to protect some of the individuals, it protects all of us. And it's just so important to maintain it and the danger to every one of us if we don't. Stanley, again, your point is very well taken. And <clears throat> let's underscore the need to make sure that we know what we're talking about and that what we're talking about has been vetted and proven in a reliable court of public opinion, not the social media court of public opinion. Um, I'm not sure that that caution only applies to matters of sexual misconduct, though I think matters of sexual misconduct um, affect us in a very unique way. Um, I want to I want to flag and not not get sidetracked by it, but I want to flag for you. I've had this conversation with many Jewish uh, journalists who have to make the call as to whether to report allegations, knowing that the life of this person well before there will be a chance to vet it properly um, is available. The decision to report or not report, that is agonizing. Um, okay, I wanna step into the gray with you a little bit more. You know, we like to think that the world of ethics and morality is, uh, is well demarcated is, uh, you know, black and white. We like to think even in our own Jewish language about the Yetzer Hatov, our good inclination, and our Yetzer Hara, our evil inclination. But we know deep down, both within ourselves and, uh, and about each other, that human beings are far more complex than a binary understanding of the impulses that reside within us. 
The late Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, Aleva Shalom, used to call this kind of thinking moralistic dualism. The tendency to think you're either a monster or you're a saint, but you can't be both. But you know, even the Talmud notes that without our yetzer hara, without our evil inclination, we wouldn't be moved to have sex and, and, and procreate and build families. We wouldn't be moved to want to achieve certain uh, measures of status and build homes and beautiful buildings, right? The, 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 the Talmud understands that even in our most noble aspirations in life are also shades of some of our less noble qualities and less noble desires. Uh, in source five on your source sheets, you see it in Brashit Rabbah, exactly what I just shared with you, the acknowledgement of the role of the Yetzer Hara, even in bringing to light that we think of as having great merit. Begging the question, so are people who do terrible things necessarily terrible people? And let's remind ourselves of who we are in having this conversation, the bearers of a tradition, treasure that acknowledges human frailty, that acknowledges flawed leaders, actually, especially in the realm of sexual behavior. Think of the way Avraham passed his sister off, passed his wife, Sarah, off as sister, making her vulnerable to sexual exploitation. Think of, in another realm, Yaakov lying to Yitzchak and lying to Law. Think of Yaakov's favoritism. Think of David HaMelech's philandering. And I might remind you, we still recite to him. We still <laughs> chant from the Book of Psalms, though he is the supposed author of it. Think in the most uh, dramatic way of the, the Yechis, if you will, the lineage of the Mashiach himself, Mashiach ben David, right? The Messiah who comes from the lineage of David. Well, let's just think a little bit about the two sides of David's family, right? On the one hand, he comes from Boaz. On the other, he comes from Ruth. Well, Boaz is actually the offspring of the offspring of a licentious, liaison between Yehuda and his daughter-in-law Tamar, right? Yehuda had three sons. He married Tamar to the first, he died, gave her the second like he's supposed to, he dies. Not surprisingly, he withholds his third son who he really was supposed to give to her. She, with no currency as a woman in the ancient world without a husband, dresses up like a prostitute, seduces her father-in-law Yehuda and gets pregnant. Saves his life too. Um, and um, she becomes pregnant with the ancestors of Boaz. Boaz then marries Ruth, who we're not supposed to marry, Ruth HaMoabia, Moab, the name of the nation from May of, a nation produced from the offspring of the relationship between a father and his daughters in the wake of the destruction of Stom and Amorah. So our Messiah comes on the one hand from a father-in-law sleeping with his daughter-in-law and on the other from a father sleeping with his daughter and boom, have yeah. If there was ever a tradition that could accept the flawed, failed character that resides within our limited human souls, it is ours. Not just accept it, but believe in capacity for rehabilitation. Rehabilitation to the point where you could become the Mashiach. That's a big wow moment that a lot of people don't think about. Um, if you, Morton, did you wanna say something? I'm troubled by what you just said, because it really uh, mean what, what what you're assuming is that these we'll put in quotes indiscretions of the ancestors so taint the lineage 
that you couldn't imagine that someone from that lineage could be uh, the Mashiach. And that seems really problematic to me. Um, if I painted it with dramatic flourish, it's to make the point that if the Torah says, the Torah says explicitly, you are not to marry anybody from the nation of Moab. And then we have somebody who says, you know, to hell with that, I'm going to marry a Moabiah. For the Torah to not just um, allow for that transgression to unfold in the narrative of our people, but to, from that transgression, yield the Mashiach, it's less about the capacity of, of um, that particular human being to overcome the indiscretions of their ancestors. It's about the indiscretion of the ancestors having the capacity to transform the world in spite of the blight or the stain on their moral characters, right? So the rehabilitation goes, goes further back. I'll take your point and I'll be more, more precise in terms of where the rehabilitation lies. But, but David himself, as we know, um, is subject of major criticism for his own moral uh, failures. And still, Mashiach ben David, he's in the same boat. And he got to build the, he got to build the bait. Well, he didn't get to build the Beit HaMikdash because he, was, he had too much blood on his hands. Um, the, the point I think is, is made in terms of our tradition's willingness to, um, to see a future beyond failure, a future beyond sin. I wanna um, ask you to take a look at the sixth source, which comes from a really interesting, um, actually comes originally from a blog of uh, uh, letters that were exchanged between a secular atheist in Spain and an American-based Orthodox Jewish woman. It's called Letters to Yosef. And they back and forth about the nature of Jewish practice and Jewish belief. And they ended up in a conversation about another person who could be the focus of our discussions tonight, Rabbi Barry Frindell. Rabbi Barry Frindell is a prominent uh, rabbi in the Washington DC area. He's a very well-respected scholar, both within the Jewish community as a halakhist and beyond. He taught at Georgetown. And he was a community rabbi who among his various tasks also facilitated many people's conversions to Judaism. He was um, indicted and jailed for being found guilty of voyeurism. He had set up a hidden camera in the community mikvah and videotaped dozens of women as they prepared to immerse in the mikvah naked, of course. Uh, this scandal rocked the Jewish world within and well beyond DC. He was a very beloved rabbi who took advantage of extremely vulnerable women who trusted him. And many people were uh, just shell-shocked and enraged and disgusted. The author of this blog writes how she was having a conversation with a friend when she mentioned something about trying to reach out to Rabbi Frindel to see if he was okay. Turned out she had known him very well and that um, her experiences of him were very positive. And she told a story about how Rabbi Frindel once went out of his way above the call of duty to do something, an act of great kindness for her when she was in a vulnerable place. So the author of the blog says to her friend, how can you reconcile the kind and friendly and warm, funny man that she knew this rabbi to be with his being indicted for having violated women in such a despicable way. And she recounts that her friend said something to the effect that people are complicated and good people can do really awful things. And Rabbi Frindel did awful things and should pay the consequences for those actions. Aside from the damage he did to the security and dignity of the women, he brought shame and dishonor on himself too and on Jews as a whole, but she went on. Does that mean that the wonderful things he did, like helping her friend in the hour of need, did that mean that that meant nothing? Is Rabbi Frindel a good person because of the good things he did or is he a terrible person because of the terrible things that he did? If we acknowledge somebody's virtues, does that necessarily mean that we are ignoring their vices or absolving them of their accountability for their vices? 
Can you appreciate somebody's artistic talent without condoning their morals? Can we read the halachic commentary of Rabbi Frindel without endorsing or in any way um, diminishing the, um, the, 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 the terribleness of his crime? And it was a crime. By the way, in April of 2020, Rabbi Frindel was released early from jail because of uh, the COVID crisis that was overtaking um, um, uh, many of the jails. Um, there was a letter sent to Orthodox congregations in DC telling their members about his release and pledging that if the 68 year old former rabbi uh, came to Daven in their shuls, he would be turned away and would not be welcome to Daven in their shuls. So we have to ask ourselves, why is it so important to us to place people in these seemingly hermetically sealed boxes of good and bad? Why is it important to us? Why is that our instinct in many cases? Because we wanna disassociate ourselves. And we also wanna assure ourselves that we are not capable of committing that same sin, that same offense. And by othering those who do, it helps us to sort of maintain our own sense of self and our own integrity. But she concludes in her blog that we have to remember it's not our inherent nature that makes us different from anybody who commits a heinous crime. It's the way we exercise our choices. It's the choices we make every single day about how we wield the power that we each have in this world. So good guy or bad guy isn't necessarily what you are, it's what you choose to make of who you are. Let's think about this notion of tshuva or repentance. In 2015, right after he was imprisoned, Rabbi Frindel wrote a public letter saying, no matter how many times I attempt to apologize, it will never be enough. There are simply no words available to sufficiently assuage the hurt that I caused. There is no excuse for what I've done. Again, I'm truly sorry. And in time for Yom Kippur in 2017, I believe you have this on your sheets. He wrote, no matter how many times I attempt to apologize, it will never be enough. I am sorry beyond measure for my heinous behavior and the perverse mindset that provoked my actions. As I sat in the courtroom listening to the victim impact statements, each felt like a blade entering my gut. The speakers expressed their feelings of rage, hurt, humiliation, vulnerability, and violation. How could I have been so incredibly blind, so unaware of my impact on others? I ask myself that question every single day. So what do we make of statements like this? Can people be larger? Then their actions. If you've never read the book by Brian Stevenson, Just Mercy, I beg you to read it. One of the most important books that surfaces um, the, the corrupt criminal justice system within the United States. But he makes a very, very important statement. He argues, he's put his life to, uh, to, to this point saying that people are more than the worst things they've ever done. People are more than the worst things they've ever done. So what do we make of people who may have committed unforgivable actions? Can we forgive the person, but not the action? Gila. Um, I think in all of these things, whatever we hear about sports figures, who, whoever they are, it's not about the person who's committed the crime, but it's about um, his, this person's victims. And if you, if you uh, say it's okay, or you, 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 whatever, let them get onto the team, you watch their, this, you do that, that victim is sitting there saying, I can't imagine what that victim feels. So to me, it's inexcusable. I don't even care about that person, but the person who had the crime done against them is would be, it's it's unforgivable. So it's about them, and 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 they're all they're saying is it's okay what this person did to me, and I, I can't. I feel for them, and that it's 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 just inexcusable to 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 allow that to happen or to you know. That's a it's. it's such an important point, Gila. Um, and in fact, I'll just quickly point to you all to uh, source number nine from an article in the foreword that appeared um, about the accusations against Rabbi Karlibach. And um, 
uh, this author, Laura Atkins, quotes a comment made on Facebook when this whole issue blew up, saying, when any known abuser is publicly praised, his Torah and or achievements discussed, his songs sung, then this confirms that abusers as a class are safe, and by contrast, that their victims, who know how easily victimization occurs, are unsafe. Yet another piece of, of, of what needs to be weighed and balanced. Um, Howard and then Jordan. Um, I'm having some problems in terms of the fact that I don't think that anything that a Jew does is done in isolation. We all read headlines uh, and, and we say, my God, he was one of us. How, how can this possibly happen? What will the world think? But at the same time, I also know that the world is watching us in terms of how we treat the people that commit these acts. And I, my question would be, what is it that we are directed to do as Jews? What, what is the ethical answer? Because on the one hand, as you say, we hate the crime, but we are told that there has to be justice. And by shunning or isolating or ignoring the person and the world is watching us, is that really the appropriate behavior? And that, that, that is my question. I, uh, I appreciate very much what you say, Howard. You remind us that it's not only about uh, reacting to someone who has abused their power to be either mekadesh Hashem or mechalel Hashem, but the very way we react to them and treat them as a community is itself an expression of either bringing sanctification or bringing um, uh, a lack of dignity to our communities. It's a really important point. Um, Jordan. As, mm, as someone who's been a, a victim of a crime and who lives daily with the impact of that, um, I struggle with this question every 15 minutes. Um, and of, of the question being what they, and if, can, can, you, <clears throat> can you separate the action from the person? Um, and not knowing the person, only knowing their action. Uh, I, I don't know if I could. Um, uh, I, I actually, I could probably at some point forgive their action, but not the person. Interesting. Hmm. Um, you know, what, what goes, not what goes without saying, what, requ what requires us to also say, or at least ask is, how, how would we really know when someone has expressed regret and done tshuva in a way that warrants even considering our responsibility to grant forgiveness? And related to that, who really has the right to forgive when apologies are made? The victims, the community whose, whose reputation and dignity was uh, affected as well? broader society. Remember the book, The Sunflower by Simon Wiesenthal? When a dying Nazi begs forgiveness so that he can die with a clear conscience. And Simon Wiesenthal tells the story and how he just bolted out of the room. And then he asks all these different leaders to respond, what, what, what would you have done? Rabbi Heschel basically said it most succinctly when he said, nobody can forgive a crime committed against another person. So how do we understand our responsibilities in light of those, in light of those insights? And um, I'll just throw one more thing in the mix for you. Regarding people about whom we may not be convinced of their remorse or their tshuva, you know those three lines that we chant right before we say kol nidre? Yeshiva Shamana, right? Ubi Yeshiva Shamatan, the Yeshiva on high and the Yeshiva on low. 
We ask for permission. To daven with the sinners. We ask permission to build community, to stand before God with people whom we know, including ourselves, who have failed. Stanley. When, when I think of uh, the perpetrator and a crime and a victim, the per perpetrator usually gets more publicity and thereby sympathy because he's the celebrity and the media covers him and we tend to forget the victims. But one of the victims or some of the victims that bother me the most is the perpetrator's family. Uh, I'm just using this as an example because I have to mean male. If a, if a man commits an assault or any other serious crime, what effect does this have on his kids who have to go to school and all his friends know what his father did? His wife who's played bridge with her neighbors over the years is humiliated to go and play bridge with her friends. These are corollary um, uh, residual effects on those around us. And that's a, that's a terrible thing to do to your family as well as to the victims. I'm not minimizing that. But it's yeah. not only the victims of it, you know, a, a spouse is just absolutely, just de I don't think devastated is enough for the description. And yeah. we sort of forget about that sometimes. Yeah, thank you. Um, as we make our way towards, uh, towards the end of our, of our discussion tonight, I just want to share with you that um, Neshama Karlibach, who's Rabbi Karlibach's daughter and who sang with him, you know, the irony in, in the case of Rabbi Karlibach is that he actually did so much to, to promote the role of women in, uh, in the Jewish world and in, in community. Neshama has gone on record saying that, you know, focusing on the allegations against her father when he's not alive anymore to be able to answer for his deeds hurts his family. Um, and distracts all of us from working on the real cases that are happening today of sexual predation within the Jewish community and distracts us from doing the work of building the safety mechanisms that are needed to protect people who are vulnerable. Um, even some who first called out the allegations against him have gone on record to say that they're not interested in silencing his music because far more powerful a response would be to build those very safety systems in the Jewish community to prevent and to prosecute violators of sexual ethics. The last uh, piece that I wanna share with you before um, coming to that last component of the, of the session about trying to resolve this, offering any other thoughts armed now as we are with Jewish tradition is the possibility of a middle way and so I invite you to look at a piece that appeared in the Globe and Mail just uh, a few weeks ago, December 29th, where there was a very live and active conversation about whether we could still enjoy reading Harry Potter books if we don't want to support or endorse JK Rowling, who has um, gone on record with some very hurtful and prejudiced things to say about uh, the trans community. So there is a writer um, who reported that, uh, there, a writer, uh, Aja Romano, who's a non-binary writer, who's been a Harry Potter super fan for almost as long as the books have existed. And he explained a point beautifully in another article, and this is his quote. I think cancel culture is best treated like a collective decision to minimize the cultural influence a person and their work have moving forward, they wrote explaining that while we might still enjoy art by Ezra Pound and H.P. Lovecraft, Woody Allen and Michael Jackson, it's no longer acceptable to talk about that work without acknowledging the creator's racism or predatory behavior. What would it mean 
to evolve this middle way where we may make choices not to silence and not to marginalize and not to put in cheirim, but to put some framing around work that we consider has value, aesthetic, moral, intellectual, but nonetheless needs to be contextualized for the very troubling uh, either origins or troubling implications that other work from this creator may have generated. Think about the conversation around um, removing Confederate statues in Southern American states. There are those who say, take them down. They don't belong in our landscape anymore. And there are others who say, no, keep them up. They're part of our history. We have to learn from them. But the way we learn from them is not to just keep them up without any kind of commentary around them, keep them up, but make sure that there is an educational enterprise that allows people to understand why they are here and what story they are telling. Think of the way um, Canada has, um, um, has created the land acknowledgement as a way of both um, benefiting from the places we find ourselves, but also framing our presence there with a humbling recognition of what happened. Is there a way to have this conversation about boycotting the work of artists who have been accused of violations that do not belong within Jewish community or Jewish discourse by bringing framing to it? What do you think? I mean, in what regards to, to Reb Shlomo Karlobach, I think it would be very difficult for a chazan each time before he or she sings a nigun attributed to him to say, well, before I sing Lechadodi to the tune of Reb Shlomo Karlobach, just know that he is accused of this, 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 and this. I know it's very, it's a very specific example, um, You're right. but the truth is, I, I don't know. I don't know. You're right. I, it's, it's. I wish I had a response. Be difficult to implement in certain cases. I, I hear you. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that? Sure, Gila. I don't know if you can do that in the moment, um, but you can do that, you know, in other places, like on your website, say, you know, we are still using Karl Bach, but we are, we, we recognize the pain that he caused. Um, so that there's always a kind of an asterisk or footnote that people carry around. Um, is that fair to them? You know, if they really made teshuva, if they've really done everything possible and paid their, their dues, I don't know if it's fair or not but that may be the price that, that's paid. It's an interesting thought, Gila, thank you. So look, there are no simple answers here. Um, and it should be abundantly clear by now that our uh, coming together for these conversations does not have an agenda of collectively arriving at one position or another. The most important thing that we're doing together when we examine these issues is to raise difficult conversations and to think together about how we make the choices we make in our lives and the impact of those choices on ourselves and on the people around us. And to circle back to um, the themes embedded in many of your comments, to consider the choices we make in light of not just their impact on other people, their impact on the building of a world in which we want to live, in which we and our families and children will be judged with the kind of hearts and eyes that we ourselves wish to be judged with when we, and we do and will, uh, also meet moments of failure and lapses of judgment in our own right. Armed as we are now with some greater insights from the tradition Going back to the original question submitted to the ethicist, does anybody feel uh, any kind of shifting or opening or changing 
of the feelings with which you originally looked at this question an hour, almost an hour and a half ago. Anything that you want to share before I share with you what the ethicist offered in their response? Okay, I hope I hope your silence is an indication that there's a lot on the table to think about, um, and not that no thinking has happened <laughs> in the last ninety minutes. So um, here is the way the ethicist responded. It's a lengthy response. I'll try to summarize it for you. Um, and then we will uh, conclude with Kadish Durabhan. The ethicist um, wrote as follows. When news of Dylan Farrow's accusation against Woody Allen resurfaced earlier this year, I received many emails that were all different versions of the same questions. Is it acceptable? to continue watching and re-watching Alan's films if any part of me believes he may have molested his adopted daughter. Your question is similar and different. You're wondering if it's okay to stop watching his movies, even if he's being convicted of absolutely nothing and insists that he's innocent. My answer to both questions is yes. In other words, it's okay to, to watch and it's okay to stop watching. First of all, the use of the word boycott in this instance is not accurate, is not inaccurate, but it's a little hyperbolic, he said. You can argue that any personal act is political, but your decision to stop paying for Woody Allen's films is not a meaningful commercial penalty relative to his stature in the culture. Right? That's the whole point of asking yourself, will my, will my decision actually have the impact that I wish for it to have? At this point, I'm going back to the ethicist. What's really at stake is his reputation and his cinematic legacy. The bigger question is how you will think about Woody Allen and his work going forward. How does one separate morality from artistic production? The meaning and significance of that separation is an old question that will be debated forever and I could never resolve it. So I'm going to address the, the specific question and its interrelated opposite. Why is it okay to stop watching his films without proof of illegality? And why is it okay to keep watching his films if you have doubts about his moral character. The first answer is straightforward. You don't need any justification for not watching someone's films. It's not jury duty, it's entirely optional. The second answer is harder, or maybe it just seems harder. The discomfort people feel from continuing to enjoy the work of a problematic artist is more complicated because it can be seen as a societal reinforcement of their behavior. There are many who find themselves wondering if they can still love Manhattan or crimes and misdemeanors if allegations against Woody Allen are true. It's highly unlikely, however, that those same people would wonder if they would need to move a house if they discovered that the carpenter who built it had been accused of the same offense. That's because of art's exceptionalism. We view artistic endeavors as different from other works, but it's the same exceptionalism that allows a person to consume art by people whom they see rightly or wrongly as mine. Monstrous. What you know about an artist can inform the experience you have with whatever they create. But film is not a product that has just one utility. It's a collection of ideas that can be weighed and considered in concert with one another. Watching a movie is not a tacit endorsement of the person who made it. You uh, unconsciously inject whatever you know or suspect about a film's director or its screenwriter, its cast or the studio paying for it into the film itself. You effortlessly create new meaning that doesn't ignore or exempt whatever other issues surround it. It's not as if watching a movie magically eliminates what you know about the person who directs it. The obligation of the audience is to watch with a fair mind, to neither deny what you know about its real world creation, nor fabricate a fictional subtext that suits you and what you want to believe. So that is how the ethicist answered the question, which I think if we needed to paraphrase is about being honest with ourselves, being aware of the different dimensions to the choices that we make and, um, and owning them in a way that allows us and those around us to live with them without losing a sense of integrity or moral coherence. Trevor, I want to thank you so much for being with me tonight um, to examine a very complicated, very, um, um, very urgent and compelling issue. 
Uh, I hope you'll keep thinking and keep wrestling. And I hope you'll join us again for our next Every Ethics session, uh, which I think is happening on the 23rd of February, where we're going to be examining. Um, Adam, what's our topic? The topic is the ethics of shopping. Is it ethical to try on shoes in a store and then buy them online? Hmm. The way the internet has complicated even our, uh, our, our habits of consumption if we try to live yeah. in a moral universe. I also want to just flag for you this coming Tuesday night from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. So excited to bring you Ground Waves, which is a one-hour beautiful program that weaves together gorgeous music provided by the inimitable Dan Nadell, together deep Torah reflections for me and a fascinating interview with someone either within or beyond the Jewish community that's doing interesting things or saying interesting things with which we want to be in conversation. Uh, you'll meet artists, activists, doctors, philosophers, uh, people from, from all over uh, the world. This coming Tuesday, my guest is Dan Senor, who is the co-author of Startup Nation. He is a public intellectual and commentator on matters involving the Jewish community, the innovation economy, as well as the geopolitical world um, and its uh, perilous state. Um, that we're living in right now um, in many corners of the earth. He's a fascinating guy, and I, I look forward to, a, to seeing you all on Tuesday night. If you, it's your habit to stand for Kaddish Rabbanan, please join me and unmute if you would wish to uh, respond to the Kaddish. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Have a thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Laila Tov. Laila Tov. Have a good night, everybody. Thank mm -hmm. you.